My name is Marlo Hood. Welcome to a new episode of the AFP Foundation's Primer for Journalists on Climate Change and Sustainable Development. You may have seen or heard a slogan popular among environmental activists. There's no plan B for the planet. Point taken. If we fail in our stewardship of Earth, humanity may not get a second bite at the apple. But there is something many scientists refer to as a plan B, and it's called geoengineering. So here's the question we'll be asking today. Is geoengineering a bad idea whose time has come? When I think about climate change, there are three scenarios that can keep me awake at night. Here's the first. What if humanity fails to keep global temperatures from rising more than two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial benchmark? That's the amount of warming scientists say we can tolerate without catastrophic consequences. While there are many reasons to think this goal can be reached, it's not hard to imagine what might go wrong. It could be a political failure to set ambitious goals, or an inability to decarbonize the global economy fast enough. Scenario number two. Let's say we do manage to meet the two degree target, but discover that the best guesstimate of scientists on where to draw the line turned out to be wrong. Look at what's happened already with less than one degree of warming. The polar ice cap is disappearing along with the world's glaciers. Half the coral in the oceans are already dead. Superstorms boosted by rising seas are more destructive than ever. It may turn out that two degrees is more than we can handle. And here's the scariest scenario of all. What if, by the time we stop burning fossil fuels, our planet has passed a tipping point and starts to warm up all by itself? It's happened before, millions of years ago, and it could happen again. How? Trapped inside the frozen soil of Siberia and Canada is a reservoir of carbon in the form of a potent greenhouse gas called methane, several times bigger than all the carbon humanity has dumped into the atmosphere in the last 200 years. At least it used to be trapped by something called permafrost. But here's the rub. With air temperatures in the subarctic region heating up at twice the global average, permafrost just isn't that permanent anymore. You can see where I'm headed. If even a small percentage of that toxic buried treasure leaks into our atmosphere, all the effort humanity will have made to reduce its collective carbon footprint will likely be overwhelmed. Which brings us to geoengineering, considered by most climate scientists as a last resort option. As you will see, some of it sounds like science fiction, but make no mistake, researchers around the world are busy cooking up a whole menu of schemes just in case. Geoengineering solutions to global warming are grouped into two broad categories. One is direct carbon dioxide removal, which tackles the problem at its root by extracting greenhouse gases from the air. The other, called solar radiation management, offers different techniques for reflecting a little bit of the sun's light and heat back into space. Let's have a look at some specific ideas falling into each category. Carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas trapping the sun's heat, so it makes sense to try and suck it out of the air. One device that does this with great efficiency is called a tree. Trees release CO2 when chopped down, but absorb it while growing, which is why reforestation can play a key role in drawing down the extra greenhouse gases we have put into the atmosphere. Another technique is making something called biochar. The recipe is pretty simple. Take crop or forestry waste and, rather than burning it and pumping CO2 in the air, convert it into charcoal, which traps CO2 in a stable state. At the high-tech end of the spectrum, some companies have succeeded on an experimental scale in extracting CO2 straight out of the air. From there, it can be stored in abandoned mines or mixed with other gases, such as hydrogen, to produce recyclable fuel. Bill Gates is among the many investors in such schemes. Yet another approach is sowing the ocean with dust-like iron, which creates huge colonies of iron-eating microorganisms called phytoplankton that absorb CO2 and, when they die, take it to the bottom of the sea for a very long time. All of these methods work, but all are problematic too. Planting trees is great, but if so many have been cut down, it's because hungry people need space to plant crops and wood for fuel or income. 
With 7 going on 11 billion people in the world, there isn't a lot of room for expanding forests, especially in the tropical regions where trees are better at absorbing CO2. Biochar will have a marginal effect at best, and direct CO2 capture is expensive and may take decades before it can be applied, assuming it works, on an industrial scale. And fertilizing the oceans with iron could cause as many problems as it solves. When it comes to the other option, reducing solar radiation, the action moves into the upper reaches of the atmosphere and even beyond. One scheme worthy of a Star Trek episode would place giant mirrors in space to reflect back one or two percent of the sun's radiation, just enough to cool the planet a shade or two. It could work in theory, but so far has stayed on the drawing board. A less costly way to achieve the same result would be to imitate the impact of a major volcanic eruption, such as the Philippines' Mount Pinatubo in 1991, which lowered Earth's surface temperature for a year or two after spewing billions of tons of sulfate particles into the stratosphere. Two other techniques rely on the power of white surfaces to bounce the sun's heat back in the direction it came from, brightening ocean clouds and whitening the world's urban rooftops. But, once again, some of these schemes may have unintended consequences, while others may only help at the margin. Beyond the flaws or merits of any particular idea, there's something else quite worrisome about geoengineering in general, a false sense of security. As we confront the challenge of climate change, such schemes may lead us to think, clever as we are, that we'll always find a last minute fix to our problems. Despite all these concerns, however, major scientific bodies such as Britain's Royal Society and the UN's advisory body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have begun to evaluate the feasibility, cost, and possible dangers of geoengineering. Because one day, if not today, it may be a bad idea whose time has come. I recently talked about geoengineering with energy expert Jim Williams, who's chief scientist and director of the San Francisco-based firm E3. Here's what he had to say. I think the first thing I would say is you don't deploy anything without doing your best to understand its consequences. And so, um, you know, some people have talked about putting iron filings in the ocean to cause big um, algae blooms that will absorb um, CO2 and uh, then sink and become buried in the sediments and sequester carbon that way. But, um, but marine scientists who've looked at that think that that could be a disaster for the ocean food chain. And, um, and people looking at afforestation projects, um, you know, afforestation sounds sort of uncontroversial, but in fact, once you get to the levels of afforestation needed, if that's going to be your primary carbon sequestration strategy, you start running into global limits on fresh water supplies, nutrient supplies, running into competition for, for, for agriculture. So uh, whatever approach is taken, you know, mirrors in space, aerosols, and so forth. Uh, we really need to be understanding the consequences. And so, if any of these are even being contemplated now, then in parallel with the research on the technologies, you also need to have research on the impacts and how those can be mitigated if they can be mitigated. Uh, so of all the schemes that are out there, if we had to turn to geoengineering, which would you say is the one most <laughs> worth investing in? One of the uh, technologies that nobody could object to if it was low cost is direct air capture. Um, that is to say, some technology that sucks the CO2 straight out of the atmosphere, filters the air of it, uh, uh, of CO2, and then injects it into some stable storage. Massive air filter for CO2. Massive air filter for CO2. And there are a lot of different approaches that have been proposed. And there are some companies that are developing commercial technologies for that right now. One other that seems benign is 
is the white is white roofs in urban settings. So in other words, ur there's already something called an urban heat island effect where uh, because we have dark surfaces, dark surfaces absorb sunlight, um, that, that cities heat up relative to the surroundings. And, and actually something as simple as painting roofs white, especially in the, um, in the uh, 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 tropical and subtropical regions of the earth, uh, could have some effect on on the Earth's reflectance, its albedo, that would tend to reduce warming. But probably the scale of that is not very large. So at the end of the day, uh, is geoengineering a bad idea whose time has come? <laughs> well, from my perspective, the time has certainly not come yet because um, I'm very optimistic that it's still possible to deeply reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, in a way that will keep us below the, the danger level. That's a definitely by a long shot a second best or third best or tenth best option because you end up doing lots of things that could have side effects that either we know are bad or we may not know they're bad but they will turn out to be bad. Anytime you try to fix a problem by inducing a new problem, you know, that's that's not really the way you want to go. So let's end this session with a couple of tips for journalists. The first one is this, watch out for boosters. When it comes to geoengineering, there are a lot of companies out there and the scientists who work for them who are going to be plugging their products and their services. That's something you need to be aware of. Secondly, evaluate geoengineering schemes on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not all good or all bad. You really need to look at them one by one. Who could object, for example, to painting rooftops in urban areas white? That just is common sense. Throwing up millions of tons of sulfate in the atmosphere, on the other hand, while it may block the sunlight, it may cause other problems as well. And it certainly won't solve one major one, which is the acidification of the oceans. That's something that you should point out. Third tip, get your information or your scientific information from neutral and reliable sources. There are several of them out there. The first one to turn to is probably the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a body of 3,000 scientists that have been studying this question for many years now. There are also national academies uh, in Britain, the Royal Society in the US as well, uh, that are excellent sources of information on this. Fourth, and finally, put your story in a larger context. And there is a very important larger context here. Humanity at this point is at a crossroads. We're facing a choice. We can either continue to live, produce, and pollute the way we have up to now, or do we really want to transform the way we produce energy uh, and the way we uh, pollute uh, our planet so that we don't need to have resort to such schemes as this? That's it for this session. So let me leave you with four key points about geoengineering. The first is a definition. The deliberate intervention in the climate system to counteract man-made global warming. Secondly, a reminder that there are two categories of geoengineering. One, radiation management, which is deflecting some of the sun's energy back into space. And the second is the direct removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere either through natural means like reforestation or through technical means by sucking it straight out of the air. Third, geoengineering is not a magic bullet. Finally, geoengineering is still seen by the vast majority of scientists as a solution of last recourse. 